Hello there, everybody. It's me, Gary Kidney, the co-host of You've Got to Be Kidding Me on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. And I am Liam Jones, my full name, and I am also a part of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network as a co-host for You've Got to Be Kidding Me. We are a TNA history podcast that covers TNA one month at a time. We cover all the drama, all the matches, all the Vince Russo nonsense you could ever want in your life. Have you you heard of TNA? I bet you have. But would it be funnier if two people made jokes over it the whole time? Probably. So if that sounds like fun to you, check it out on this very Voices of Wrestling podcasting network, and Liam will do bits and whatnot. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Welcome to episode 100 of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungy here on the Voice of Wrestling Podcast and Network. I'm your host, Tyler Forrest. With me, as always, is Fred, the Forbidden Boar Moreland. How are you, sir? Wonderful. I'm just doing great. How are you? Good. Uh, how does it How does it feel to have climbed that hill this weekend? Uh, very tiring. Uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, we are joined by a very special guest this week, Adam Berger. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Excited to be here to talk some Forbidden Door and, uh, I don't know, see what else we get into. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, it's, it's the NBA draft. Anything can happen tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know, Adam, he's a contributor to Voice of Wrestling, um, made numerous appearances on the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast hosted by Jesse Collings. And I'm, I'm really excited to have the conversation about this because Fred and I revealed our ballots last week, Adam. And I don't think – I don't know if I've seen your ballot yet. I'm really excited to kind of talk about the the top of this because it's it's a very interesting. Um, two of these, the top five wrestlers, you could argue that most of America has never seen wrestle. And that is not something that I would have expected coming in. But I also think it's great because it really shows the amount of diverse voices that we have here at Voices of Wrestling and the amount of people that have seen uh, these two. And we'll start with them. Number three is Yuma Anzai from All Japan. And number four is Shun Skywalker of Dragon Gate. Um, Adam, did they appear on your list at all? And are you comfortable having these two this high? They were both on my list. They were both in... So Shun was definitely in my top five. I can't remember exactly, but he was definitely in my top five. And Anzai, he might have been in my top five. If he wasn't, he was definitely in my top ten. So yeah, I don't have any problem with both of these guys being... Top five. They're both uh, fantastic wrestlers. Shun is so Shun is so much fun. He's just insane, and I just I love watching him uh, every time I get the chance. Oh, and I, I remember hearing stories about him at WrestleMania weekend. Everybody's out there. Um, the Dragon Geek guys are out there trying to sell merch, and he's just like pff, blows everything off. Won't even travel with the other Dragon Gate guys because he's a heel. Oh, I love real workers. It just makes me happy. Um, I had Anzai at five and Skywalker at 11. These two are just awesome. Um, I think if they would have popped up at some point over the last couple of years in a major promotion that gets more attention nat- like worldwide than all-, all Japan and Dragon Gate, I think a lot of people would be not necessarily more comfortable, but they'd have a better understanding of why these guys are so great. And I think a list like this can really propel people to be like, who the hell is Yuma Anzai? And go take a look at him. And that that's what makes me really excited about something like this. Well, what I'm taking away from uh, from Reddit is people should instead say, this is biased against what I like, which is WWE. Um, yeah. And therefore bad. I'm going to talk about this. I'm hijacking the show. So I went on r slash Squared Circle and posted the, the links to the uh, 16 through 30 and then 1 through 15 when they were published. And... Um, uh, uh, I'm just going to tell you right now, if uh, you want to say anything other than fed good, uh, our squared circle is not the place to do it. Uh, this is an anti-endorsement. Um, these, these jamokes, um, are, uh, rushing in there to, uh, complain about Braun Breaker not making the list, which is very funny, I guess, you know, if you, 
literally don't watch anything else and you'd be like oh boy i only know three wrestlers that are under 30 apparently hey i i will say i had braun breaker 29 i i i I, I think he should be included in the list i cut him late i had him like 33rd or something like i like braun breaker i think he's put it together some this year i think the tag team with baron corbin was actually way better than it should have been um i I haven't watched any of his stuff since, since he got to raw but um you know he seems like he's actually getting a real push, which is good. Um, but yeah, it's just very funny that um, the, the funniest thing is this is um, one of the early comments on this was uh, a fella coming in to say, ah, oh, Daniel Garcia. And uh, uh, who was the other person? There was someone else directly above it. Um, someone else that was they were like, oh, it's definitely fine that these people are above Rhea Ripley. And then in a, a hidden tag, um, they put the, you know, the sarcasm thing, right? The slash us. And everyone downvoted it because they were so busy going, oh, anyone who supports, you know, this is bad that we're not even going to take the second to click on the spoiler mark. Uh, it's just not a serious place for talking about wrestling if it isn't, you know, WWE or WWE adjacent. Which it, to me is very funny because WWE um, barely has wrestling in the name. Yeah, uh, well, my thing with this list is always the criteria is so general. Like it's like, like it's so many different things, right? It's like it's it's drawing potential in ring work, um, you know. Like, and we're all going to prioritize the criteria, like the cri- criteria, a little bit differently in terms of which attributes we, you know, rank higher than others. You know, are we basing it on? just pure in ring work or how big a star we think these people could be, or, you know, how important they are to their promotions, relatively speaking. So because of that, it's just, it's so open-ended. It's just funny to me that anyone would get like super upset about it. Um, anyway, (laughs) in any way, just because it's like, well, you know, the list is kind of, you know, whatever you, whatever you want to make it. And also, just in terms of like a lot of the people who are complaining, like they haven't seen like half the people on the list. So for them to, to say like, oh, how could you possibly have like these people ranked over this person that I know? It's like, well, how many of those people ranked above have you actually seen before? You know, and maybe if you have, then you would actually agree with it. But you know, they're not really what they want what they're familiar with like has to be the best because that's what they're familiar with but that's why things like this are so great though because even within vow and everyone who votes like we are not a hive mind like we disagree a lot on everything so it's kind of cool just to see how uh you know with all those different perspectives uh you know looks like this comes out in the end so uh, I want to explore that here for a minute, Adam, because you make a really interesting point that there really isn't a strong defined criteria. It's just who do you think is the best? And then there's a bunch of, of different things like, hey, in-ring work, charisma, drawing power, promo ability. But there isn't any strict criteria that you have to weigh something higher than the others. Would it be better to have a separate list, almost like Dave Meltzer with the Wrestling Observer Awards has separate most outstanding wrestler and then the Flair Fez MVP? Ooh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I think it's fine the way it is, honestly. The whole objective of it is really just to say, like, hey, who are the best, like, in general, you know, who are the best wrestlers under 30 that people should know and look into? Um, And that could be because maybe they're already great and doing incredible work, or it could be someone who's like maybe a little bit earlier on in their career. And we know that they have a lot of big potential and they're going to go on to do big things. So like you should pay attention to this person. So I don't know. I think it's fine the way it is and that it's with the names that are on it. Like I can't really complain about anything or the right like just as an example like i had mariah may rank 10th because i just i love mariah may and i think she's about to become like a really big star but she ended up being 30th but you know i understand like maybe i'm just higher on her and enjoy her work uh more than some others do but you know that that's fine you know i i had people i voted for that didn't make it and you know it's just kind of kind of the way it works but i really the whole exercise is just to say hey these are the people under 30 that whose work you should really become familiar with and whose careers you could follow. Cause if they're not already 
doing uh, big things. They will be in the future. And a lot of them are already doing great stuff right now and have been for years. And, and I, th I think that that's also a good point. It's more about opening eyes. But I think that that would be an interesting thing to kind of look at long term. I do want to attack this here because we, eventually we are going to get to um, the heat check talking about Forbidden Door and a very weird build. But are there any gentlemen wrestlers that did not make the list that were a really big surprise or a, a wrestler that made it that you were shocked that it ended up making the list over somebody else? There's no one that I was shocked that made it. Um, yeah, no one who made it, I was, I was absolutely shocked by, um, there were some people who weren't, who I, I think I was disappointed, um, didn't make it or I thought would, but I can't remember exactly who they are right now. Um, but I don't know, like, I can't really, I'm not going to make any impassioned arguments about someone who didn't make it over the, the people who did, because everybody who did was, you know, de definitely deserving. I mean, it's just, it's splitting hairs really. Uh, my two highest that didn't make the final list were Commander, who I had at 10, and uh, Mizuki, who I had at 19, or I'm sorry, 18. Uh, I thought they both were really great last year, and I was surprised that neither got uh, more appreciation for that. I think Commander, you know, granted, we can talk about how AEW doesn't really, ha has joined WWE and not booking Luchador as well, but um, I, I think that, you know, his floor is like a top guy in Mexico, which, okay, that's a really good floor to have, and then uh mizuki i thought was arguably the best worker in tokyo joshi pro and what i thought was a really strong year for them now, the one that really surprised me that didn't make the list was logan paul and oh, that one i had me too. i had logan paul at 26th last year i think i had him at 29th it, he's just so good and it sucks because logan paul um outside of the ring is kind of a tool shed Good Lord, like he is an absolute prodigy. And I, I'm considering the in-ring work that he's had over the, the course of the last year, I'm a little surprised that he fell off the list because last year, as I, I take a look, last year I think he was, um, he was 18th last year and somebody this year had him fourth. Yeah, I had him seventh, so that's two top ten votes for him. So it's uh, surprising that he didn't squeak in at 30th at least. Um, but hey, it, it's a strong field. Uh, but I think Logan Paul is just really talented, and as long as I'm not thinking about anything that has to do with him off screen, um, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of his. Um, he just isn't like as natural of a guy as I've seen in America in a couple of years, at least since MJF like came on TV for the first time, really. Yeah. Yeah. I think what holds him back is probably just like, he's only having a handful of matches a year. Um, so when you get into a list like this, unless you really love those matches, then you're probably, you know, going to put more full-time wrestlers um, ranked ahead of him. And also you're not sure how much longer he's going to do this. Like he like so I guess from both perspectives, right? Like if you're, if you're prioritizing like in ring work, like, yeah, when he wrestles, he's very good. Um, but some of his matches can get a little bit, you know, patterned or overbooked too um, at times, which can, uh, you know, especially for our tastes, probably um, hold it back a bit. But then also, like, if you're projecting, like, okay, what's he going to do in the future? Like, is I don't know. Like, he's going to start wrestling more and having more frequent great matches, or he's, is he going to do anything bigger than he's already done? So. I don't know. I think some of it might just be like a little bit lack of interest. Like last year, there might have been more intrigue still around him, like maybe what he what he could become, um, you know, how much better he could possibly get. But maybe now it's just kind of like, oh, OK, he's going to wrestle a handful of matches a year. They're going to be really good. But, you know, he just kind of is what he is at, at this point. And I think that's a very fair argument, just the lack of um, total matches is going to hinder you to a certain extent the last guy i want to talk about here before we we look at maybe a couple of interesting placements on the 30 no nick wayne he did not make yeah. the list last year but i don't i don't think we included him or because he was he had literally just turned 18 um or we did i i don't remember but his i remember highest people rank, voting for him 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, his highest ranking on the panel was 16. That was me. Um, but I'm really surprised considering how good this guy already is in the ring that he didn't make the list. And I know his AEW run has been a little weird considering it's mainly been, hey, um, your mom is hot and Christian Cage is your new stepdaddy. But he's still a tremendous talent. He did. He has given us one of the worst T-shirts uh, ever via his mother, um, with her heavily defined butt crack being featured prominently on it. Um, I, I I continue to say anyone who purchases that uh, T-shirt should be promptly sent to jail. Um, but yeah, I, I had him thirtieth uh, just because I think he's got a ton of upside. But I would like to. I thought he was a little short on like the present day stuff. Like he works every once in a while, but just as a you know, I'm going to job role. And has good matches, don't get me wrong, but, you know, um, there's just people above him that I think are more impactful on the industry right now, but I still had him in my top 30. And, uh, I was a little surprised, but, yeah. Yeah, he was on my list as well. Um, I think it's it's probably his role, right? Like, because he's more of a supporting character um, in, in Christian's act, you know, as he's gaining experience. He's definitely had some great matches on the indies, though um uh, over the years and i think he'll definitely be someone who ends up on the list you know if not next year you know, like relatively soon because he, he is very talented and he's definitely going to do uh do some big things in the future but yeah i think it, it just might be maybe the role that he's utilized in currently especially compared to a lot of like you know the talent that were on the list from mexico and japan especially you know much bigger roles in their promotions um working much more uh, many more matches regularly um and also having just like they're in positions to have like super high quality matches and main events and things which isn't really something he's had in AEW. so he, he still like he has plenty of years he has like a full decade left on the list still yes. right so he has many more appearances um that he'll make in, in that, the actual top 30 and not just the uh honorable mention coming up um oh T tyler i did remember one person i was outraged did not make it actually uh Zandikin Jr. He's a pirate luchador. Like, what are you doing <laughs> if you're not voting for him? He's he's awesome. Oh, he I is awesome. More of him. Yeah, uh, I I think part of the reason why is he may never become a big star in Mexico. Um, I, I remember somebody talking about it, and I kind of understand the thought process because he's not really booked like uh, like he's going to be a guy. He's just kind of on these cards, which is fine. Um, I think it might be better for him to maybe be that uh, that uh, CML LIJ member and just stay over in Japan because uh, I think that can be really, really, really beneficial for his career. But I love the guy. I think he's got a lot of potential. But I, th I wonder if that perceived ceiling he has in CML with how they view him, like from an outside perspective, how we kind of perceive that, uh, I think is one of the reasons why he didn't make this. He didn't make mine. Yeah, I have not seen him a whole lot, so unfortunately, I need to fix that. But I have not yet. So, how dare you, Fred? How dare you? I'm a bad person. Hey, you said it, not me. Just remember that. All right, let's uh, let's let's go through a couple of these interesting ones. Um, rounding up the top five, you have MJF at five. Um, I had him at number one. I had him at number one last year, and as much as the Brochachos thing stunk. I don't necessarily think his performance was bad. And I think his his creative ideas need a filter. Uh, I, I told Fred this, Adam. I remember watching the Death of WCW documentary on the network. And they were talking about Vince Russo. And somebody said, well, when Vince Russo was with WWF, he had Vince McMahon to filter out all the bad ideas. And all the only the good ones stayed. Once he got to WCW, everything stayed. And... The, that's when you saw a lot of the bad stuff. Well, now that we've moved forward here, I think MJF needs that Vince McMahon type filter that Vince Russo had to keep the bad ideas out. Because when the good ideas are in play, he's been phenomenal. And you, you could argue that he's on the way to being an all-timer, but you can't have any of the brochacho stuff. Um, five of a fair spot. Where did you guys have him? So I had him at uh, number two uh, behind Takeshita because Takeshita is amazing. And I think, I think he's, I mean, 
I think Will Ospreay is the best wrestler in the world, but I think Takeshita is the second best wrestler in the world. Um, so yeah, I just Takeshita was my number one, and I did feel like I think other people just left MJF off their list entirely um, because of the last last year, um, and that's why he dropped to number five. And I think I even wrote in it like he really only has himself to blame for that because when you get that sort of creative input and then that's what you come up with. It's like, oh, and it's just very disappointing because up to that point, he had been, you know, so great and so consistently great, but you know, he's, he's still like in his twenties. So I think it's natural that, you know, someone in their twenties with that much kind of power is, you know, they're going to make some mistakes and have some missteps. I do think it's interesting that pretty much as soon as he came back this year, he basically disavowed all of it immediately. And uh, we'll get into it probably in Forbidden Door, but I think his first program back being Roosh and then his Forbidden Door match being Hachisero, I think that is a rather calculated move to get uh, in good again with AEW's hardcore audience and reintegrate himself in with the sickos, uh, as they like to say, which is getting kind of lame now, actually. But uh, yeah, I had him at number two. Uh, not surprised he fell to five, though, at all. I think you know, he, he could very easily be uh, number one again next year um, in his last year of eligibility. Yeah, I had him. Uh, I had him number one again uh, because I just think he's the most talented guy. Um, if he does not, um, you know, does, if he stops doing really dumb stuff, I think it, it's really an easy vote. Um it's going to be a very interesting year to see if he uh, learns to not be dumb Um, because he's a smart guy, but he did a lot of dumb stuff and uh, hopefully he did learn from that for the sake of himself and AEW and just my watching enjoyment. Uh, But it frankly made my wife stop watching wrestling like a hundred percent. She told me that this past week, which uh, uh, because the storyline with Adam Cole was so bad, she was just like completely out of it and still not got back into it. So um yeah, sample size one, but we do have a MJF uh, anti draw <laughs> argument right there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think he's still really good at like everything that you you know goes down on your your TEW score sheet, right? But he just has to not have like the worst creative ideas in the company's history. This side of like the Nightmare Collective or whatever the the, the Brandy Road storyline was or some of the Dark hey, Order stuff. I liked the Nightmare Collective. You be nice. That, that's you over what? there on our, our island of one. I'm that, kidding. What a take. Oh. I did, that's I did right up there like with the your, your soccer joke a week ago. Hey. Hey. I stand by that. Guys are still waiting for the return of Mel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mel. <laughs> boy oh that didn't no, work no, no. poor mel yeah no bueno um all right uh kenosuke takesha to adam you voted him number one um oh, yeah. so i want your opinion on this i struggled with takesha he was at my number three because i think the potential is just absolutely boundless and absurd but i didn't have him any higher because i'm really concerned about his u.s booking uh over the course of the past few years really limiting his forward potential. Do you have any concerns in that realm? Oh, definitely. Like, I think he is the lack of follow-up and ideas for him after he beat Omega, like at at all out last year was like, if you think about just what he did and like the, this now it wasn't a total waste because, you know, they did protect him to some degree. And they used the equity that they built in him to put over Will Ospreay in Ospreay's debut. So you can't say it was like, it was like pointless, right? But just to like have him like feud with Jericho, like in that, you know, that tag team feud. And I understand Omega got hurt or he got his diverticulitis and couldn't, um, you know, couldn't keep wrestling. So we're not really totally sure exactly where that program would have gone. But it just, I don't know. I thought he just had, he's such a great, like I, like I said, I think he's like, you know, the second best wrestler in the entire world. Like he's big too. And he, he's very hard hitting and he had Don Callis to cut promos for him. It just seemed like you really could have made him into 
you know, like a main event guy or like give him a run with like the TNT title or the international title and really make him like a, a focus on a, you know, dynamite or collision every week. And they just didn't do that. And now that he's, you know, put over Osprey and it seems like now he's like kind of on the downward trend for his push. And this like upper mid card is just kind of where he's going to be. He's just going to live now. Um, so yeah, mm-hmm. I agree. I definitely have concerns about his run in AEW. But I am very intrigued to see how he does in the G1 uh, this year, because I think he and I know he maybe he's loyal to DDT, but I feel like if he was ever to work more regularly in New Japan, he could be the biggest star in Japan for you know the next decade. Um, so I don't know if that's maybe that's not realistic. Uh, maybe he will just stay in AEW or, you know, can, like go back to DDT here and there. I don't know what the future holds for his career exactly, but I don't know. I think he could just be the absolute biggest star in Japan and could be a main event guy in AEW if they're able to, you know, actually like get organized and prioritize him the way that I believe his talent deserves. Yeah, I'm fascinated to kind of see what that ends up looking like for him and especially that DDT relationship considering he's going to be in the G1. And my guess is Takeshita makes the semifinals and then loses to Yoda Suji because Takeshita beats him on night one to really establish him as a guy in New Japan canon. Fred, what's your take on Takeshita? Um, Takeshita, good. Great take. Great take, Fred. I'm proud of you. Um, yeah, I had him uh, fourth. Uh, I think he's really fantastic. Um you know, and um, like Adam talked about, even if he doesn't get the the push he deserves and should have in uh, AEW, um, the the worst case scenario is he goes back to Japan and is the top guy in DDT for years, or is a top guy in New Japan for years if they poach him. Um, like if those are the two two worst things, air quotes here that happens with them, then he's really in a great spot. So um, yeah, I. I I think he's one of the worst uh, examples of Tony's booking in the past couple of years. In fact, I've been kicking around an article idea of has Tony Khan lost his fastball, um, which uh, the answer would be yes. Um, but I think this is a great example of it. Like just a guy that should have been a really easy, like get over job and has not worked out and has fallen prey to the very AW thing of, well, we're not, we don't want to push you right now, but also we think you losing is bad. So instead we're just going to keep you off TV and uh, hope that uh, not, that isn't a negative. And we're seeing, I think with AW that being off TV is not a, a good thing for the most part. Um it's not, I don't think it's really refreshing people that much. In fact, I think it's usually, you know, you're seeing these people get chilled pretty badly. Uh, he, uh, Ricky Stark, several times now. Um, and, you know, with all the, the talk about, like, maybe Ricky Starks is just shooting down uh, ideas or whatever. Yeah, that's fine. But, um, you know, still, he, you got to come up with more than one idea for Ricky Starks. Um you know, you can add a couple other names on there, I'm sure. Um, and this is excluding injuries, of course. But it's, yeah, um, Takeshita is awesome, and he should be a much bigger deal in AEW right now. I agree completely. I had no problem with him losing a bunch to start. Like, he was jobbing to the stars. He was beating everybody else. That's fine by me. I don't really have an issue with that. I do agree about the lack of television time. Just have him beat Tony Nese or Peter Avalon every week on one of the TV shows. That's it. Yep. Sam, go out there and do cool shit. And you know what? You can have Don Cows be like, why isn't this guy getting a title shot? Why isn't this guy getting this? Build up some heat. And then eventually you can pull the trigger and be like, oh, finally he's getting that shot. And there, all you you have a story. And all it takes you is three minutes of television time a week. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I was going to say, just looking back at like stuff that happened over the, like the last six months or so, like since all out, like, you know, on that all out show, like Orange Cassidy lost the, you know, the end of his, his, you know, record breaking international uh, championship run. He lost it to Moxley. And then obviously there was some weird stuff that happened where Moxley got injured, went, dropped it to Phoenix, then Phoenix got injured and dropped it back to Orange. But in the end, it seemed like even without those injuries, their goal was Mox is going to beat Orange. Orange is going to beat Mox again to get the title back. But like, why did Mo- why did Orange have to like 
get the title back. Like his second international championship run that he had was kind of, you know, it didn't really elevate him. And, it, you know, yeah. he, he was kind of doing the same thing over again, but for a shorter, shorter time period. Like if your big thing was wanting to have Orange beat Mox, just have Orange beat Mox. And then like to, you could have like transitioned. Then Orange is really broken down. You could have had to catch to beat him to get that international championship. And then every week it's just Don Callis cutting promos to get heat and then to catch the beating someone in a great match, you know, like, and then ultimately they ended up putting the international title on Osprey. So then they just could have kept it on him until Osprey came in and then transitioned it to Osprey. If that was really the direction they wanted to go in, but I don't know. It just, it just seems like, you know, I think sometimes they get a little, like people all like to say that AEW doesn't tell stories, but I think sometimes they get a little too focused on very specific stories that they want to tell and don't take into account like the greater landscape of their roster and what they're trying to do in terms of like who they want to elevate, um, you know, who needs to be downcycled, uh, those types of things. And they're just really focused on like getting the hitting the story peaks and the specific moments that they want to get to, and they're going to get to them no matter what, you know, like we were just talking about before with the MJF stuff, Adam Cole breaks his ankle and is going to be out. God knows how long, but they still got to get to that you know, mystery devil reveal months later <laughs> for some that, reason. That was such an obvious, like not even before that, it was such an obvious, we need to shift plans now. Like, the, the red light should have been on in the cockpit and instead they were like, no, let's just keep going. I'm sure it's fine. Yeah. Why yeah, are so, probably just bad? That's not a mountain. Yeah. And so I think because they have that focus sometimes, like they miss oppor- they miss like some very natural opportunities where you could pivot and do something better with someone else you're starting to break out. Um and to guess is just one of the, you know, one of the examples of that, unfortunately. I think they really harmed Orange Cassidy. That's another great example of what I'm talking about because he his peak was the John Moxley loss, and then just, he just came back like he he was on Dynamite the the following show. Like I'm gonna come back and be stronger. And then like he was there like a week later and just like oh I'm fine now. Yeah, with with all the talk about like people like <laughs> you were just saying like being off TV doesn't necessarily help people. That was one of the few. That was one of the times where being off TV for. Been off. Yeah. Like, yeah, for a longer period would have really helped him. Uh, but, you know, it didn't. He was, you know, that, he was just eating chips with Hook like a week later, which kind of yeah. undercut the whole thing that he was, uh, you know, broken down and uh, barely hanging on. Like, it would have been the perfect, like, that's not sequel pay kind of return, right? Like, the surprise, you know, babyface comes back after, like you were saying, months of. To catch to talking shit or any heel and beats him and uh is the returning conquering hero like that would have worked really well instead we just have like orange cassidy is apparently contractually obligated to appear on tv at least once every week you just you just got me to imagine orange dressed up as cyclope cyclope but still wrestling like orange cassidy um which yeah that, i enjoyed that would have actually been a really good bit like tony shivani's like just seeing through it like instantly this that's apparently part of his gimmick is the guy who doesn't like bother buying the dumb uh kayfabe stuff um but yeah just a very uh it's it well uh, all transition here straight to talk about forbidden door outright um speaking of uh middling builds and booking jobs uh it's forbidden door 2024 <laughs> and um uh spoilers i don't think it's been a well-built show it's been very like well uh here's a six out of ten show hope you like those because that's what you're getting until uh the next pay-per-view i had i have a <clears throat> excuse me i have a controversial take i think it's been a decently built show i just think we hate it compared to the other forbidden doors and it's being judged a little bit unfairly because of how good those two cards were yeah <laughs> Forbidden Doors lost a lot of its appeal inherently because mm-hmm. a lot of the guys that we were excited to see like on Forbidden Door now are just in AEW um, all the time. So that's definitely part of uh, th- that definitely like ruined some of the novelty 
uh, for sure. I think it's I think it's kind of inconsistent. Like I think some of the matches on this show are, are like have actually been pretty well built, and I'm excited for really excited for them. Some of the matches I'm just excited for because of who's in them. Um, but yeah, it's definitely kind of up and down, and there are some matches on the card where you're just kind of like, why is this on Forbidden Door um, exactly? But I'm sure we'll get into that. Yeah, and uh, speaking of getting into the Forbidden Door card, we have another guest joining us here today, uh, the host of the award-winning uh, multiple-time-per-year wrestling omakase podcast. Uh, he is, sorry, they, they are. are, John Carroll. John, <laughs> how, how are you? How you doing? Doing to do great. A, try to do a last-minute run in here. Sorry about that. I told you, I saw your message, like, so my job is usually like easy, but the last mm-hmm. two weeks, it's actually been very difficult. So I was actually working late for very stupid reasons that uh, I can't even get, I can't get into on a podcast, but I'm done now. So hello. Hope I'm, well, hope welcome. The last minute running. Hey, you know what? This isn't even a last minute, John, because we, we just spent the first half hours talking about the uh, 30 for 30 and uh-huh. we are just starting to talk about the build for Forbidden Door. And I want to give you the floor because you have been in, uh, both publicly and privately very critical about the build to Forbidden Door. And I, I want to open up the floor to you to kind of express that. Yeah, I don't know about the – I don't know if I'd describe it as critical of the build. I mean, for the for the card they've decided to do, the build has been okay. It's just that this feels like – you know, it does not feel like a special show at all. It feels like a standard AEW pay-per-view – that happens to have a few outsiders on it. I mean, this is, we're long past the days of the first two Forbidden Doors. And I think, I I expected there to be less New Japan participation this year for a lot of reasons that some of which Adam was actually, you know, describing before I, before you uh, introduced me, but I did not expect there to be so little CMLL and stardom participation on this show. I mean, that's the part that actually really stuns me. It's for months, I feel like all we heard was, oh, there's going to be way more CMLL people this year. And, oh, we made a big deal with stardom and we got stardom people. There's one stardom person on the show. And I believe by my count, there's two CMLL people on the show, right? Stephanie and uh, Hatashero. That's the only two, I think. So, well, you know, uh, Wiki- Wikipedia has a uh, Vakir listed as a uh, new Japan. So oh. depending how you want to do your math there, I don't <laughs> she's a strong, cha- there. strong champion. She has to be new Japan. She, right. she is a strong champion, but I mean, she wrestles more frequently in CMLL. I mean, yes. I don't know. Yes. So however you, however you yeah. want to count her, it doesn't really matter. So either one CMLL person or two, depending on how you want to count her. So it's like, I just feel like we're, that's the part where I feel, you know, as a ticket holder of this show, I do feel ripped off. It's like, I thought I was buying a ticket to a show that was going to have a lot more interpromotional, you know, participation. And they might add some more people tonight to matches, but this show already has 10 matches. So like, you know, if they add Hiromu and Teton who are there tonight for Dynamite or even other names from New Japan or CMLL or Stardom, I mean, they're not going to be important matches. They could even just end up being pre-show matches. So, that to me almost does not become relevant. And I see some of the matches on the show. Why in God's name am I going to a show called Forbidden Door to see Samoa Joe, Hook, and Shibata against Chris Jericho, Brian Keith, and Big Bill? That is the most ridiculous match on this card by a mile. That's a six AEW wrestlers. Uh, you know, yeah, sure, Shibata used to be a New Japan wrestler seven years ago. Not a good reason for him to be on the show. So six AEW wrestlers, they, you know, bog standard six-man tag is a ridiculous match for Forbidden Door. The latter match is ridiculous, too. It's got four AEW wrestlers announced so far and really five. I mean, Leo Rush, you know, if you even consider him a New Japan, he's worked one New Japan match all year uh, in 2024, dating all the way back to October 2023 when he left a new Japan tour. So he's not, he's no longer a new Japan wrestler. If you want to, you'd be better off calling him a GCW wrestler. So, you know, that's another match that's basically just AEW talent. And yeah, they might throw in like Teton or somebody tonight, but it's basically an AEW match. So that's two big matches on this card that basically are just standard AEW matches. And when you're just, when you made the decision to go with Sword versus Osprey, 
as the AEW World Title match. You know, I understand that decision. I, it's a big match for them, and they, you know, I guess felt it was bigger than any possible outsider title challenge they could come up with this year, especially with Naito obviously busy in the IWGP. But once you make that decision, every other match on the Forbidden Door card needs to be laser focused at delivering the kind of interpromotional show people are expecting from Forbidden Door. If you're going to deliver that as the AW World Title match, everything else on this card has to be, you know, impeccably interpromotional. You need CMLL people in there. You need more than one stardom person in there. You need more, if the New Japan people don't want to come or they don't want to, because I've heard rumblings of that. They just don't, you know, a lot of New Japan people just didn't feel like making the trip this year, you know, and there's obviously the relationship is a little strained on, on some levels. Um that's one thing, but then you need your other partner promotions. You need to get them on this show in much more spots, in higher profile spots. I mean, MJF and Hechicero has like one and a half weeks of build. I mean, they need to be on this show, and they need to be much more focused as part of this show. It, this is just a normal AEW pay-per-view with, you know, a, a Naito IWGB title win and a few other outsiders on it. And, you know, that's honestly how it feels to me. And if this show, because I flew out to the last two Forbidden Doors in uh, Chicago and Toronto, if I had purchased a plane ticket for this show or even an Amtrak train ticket, I would be really furious right now. Thankfully, it's in my backyard. So it's, you know, whatever. I'm, it's 20 minutes from my house. And I would have gone to an AEW pay-per-view 20 minutes from my house anyway. But that's what this is. This is a normal AEW pay-per-view. So that's how I feel about it. Uh, John, John has Oh, One second, I can't. Uh, go ahead, Fred. Go ahead. I have a quick correction to John. Um, I think you're forgetting that Brian Keith is obviously a DDT representative, and uh, also Chris Jericho is here on behalf of CMLL. No, very true. Uh, I, I do have a question for you, John, because you have a much better pulse on the New Japan um, native fan base than any of us do. What's the reaction to like Will Ospreay on the show? Um, is there an extra amount of excitement because he spent so long in the company? Is is it just neutral? Hey, we saw Will forever, and like we're just gonna get to see him again, and that's cool. Like, what are the um, the native fans thinking I, about? This? I haven't honestly. I've seen almost no chatter among Japanese fans on Twitter or like uh, YouTube comments and stuff about this show. I mean, you have to remember, first of all, as a Sunday night show, this takes place, uh, I believe, 9 a.m. Because, yeah, that's 13 hours right now. This takes place 9 a.m. on a Monday. So it's not exactly going to be watched live by very many Japanese fans. On top of that, it's a it's an additional pay-per-view purchase on New Japan mm-hmm. World in Japan. So I, I would expect a lot of people are never going to see this show, honestly. But, yeah, I've seen very little chatter about it. The, the, the only topic of conversation I've seen – I haven't seen anything about Osprey. Um, you know, I haven't really seen anything about Swerve Osprey or any other uh, matches on the show ex- except for one. The big topic conversation um, on Japanese Twitter about this show is as it relates to the G1 Climax and basically saying, why is the IWGP world champion not in the G1 lineup? Because obviously the G1 lineup came out um, even before we got the Naito... Um, or is it, I think it might have been after, but, but the point is we got that, we got that announcement before Naito won the title, obviously, which everybody assumed was going to on Sunday, but Naito, there was so much chatter about that. You know, the idea that, um, Naito, you know, the, the Naito's in this tournament and the, and he's, he's the challenger for the IWGP, but the actual IWGP world champion is not in the tournament that Naito actually felt the need to come out today and say, I don't know if you guys saw this, but he came out to Tokyo sports and said, if I lose the title match at Forbidden Door, uh, I'm going to give John Moxley my G1 Climax spot, which is like one of those examples of him reading what's, you know, he does this a lot, honestly, where he reads mm-hmm. what Jap- Japanese fans are talking about and determines it's a logic gap in the New Japan booking. And he's just like, well, I'm going to fill it myself. And, you know, the reaction to this on, on a, you know, English language Twitter was very funny. We were like, oh, Mox is going to be in the G1. Like, no. I'm like, just saying this because he knows he's going to win the title on Sunday. That's why he knows he can say this. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's just – that's the only thing I've seen any chatter about, honestly. I haven't seen anyone say anything about Osprey challenging for the title. Um, I really haven't I've – seen, I've seen a few people be like, hey, where's Okada, I guess. 
<laughs> but I mean, that's a, that's been a question. Um, but yeah, not really, nothing about Osprey really, nothing about the rest of the card. If the, I, of course, doesn't mean it's not out there, but I just hadn't seen it. Is that different from past years, John, where oh, yeah. there has been a lot of chatter? Oh, yeah. This is the least buzz of the three on Japanese Twitter by a mile. And I, I don't even think it's remotely close. I, and it, it seems like that on English Twitter, too, honestly. But, yeah, I, way less chatter this year than there were in the last two years about this show. Sorry to interrupt you, uh, but this was just posted on Twitter. I'm not making a shitty joke here. Um uh, AW just put out a video with uh, Statlander and Stokely Hathaway, where they uh, issue a challenge to um, to Willow um, to a match at Forbidden Door, which uh, a friend of the everyone, Sean Cedor, is saying is looks like it's going to be Chris Statlander and Momo Watanabe against Willow and probably Tad Nakano. Wow. Well, okay, I'm glad we're getting a couple more starting people on the show at least. Yeah. I was, was also. Sure yeah, I was shocked that there was not even like a, a part of the pun start of all star like six woman tag or anything. It was nothing. And so, yeah, very odd. Now, a, uh, how they much have ha- they have a show this weekend? That's probably part of the problem. But, uh, that makes sense. Yeah, I know Willow uh, did at least one appearance in Stardom when she was the strong women's champion. Do e- either of these women have a? history and stardom at all that, that would link them to these two wrestlers or is it just hey we want to get some stardom representation on the card and this is the easiest way to do so uh so definitely the latter they don't really have any i believe that was only willow's only appearances in stardom I, I don't think chris ever appeared in stardom i could be wrong on that i'm not a stardom expert but i never remember seeing her name come up Oakley's just great at I, making deals yeah willow Absolutely. i think uh, actually well, not really a run in Tokyo Joshi, but she did two matches in Tokyo mm. Joshi Pro. So right, right. Back in 2022. Uh, I don't think she's technically wrestled at first stardom. Uh, two well, she did, a, she did a strong champion, right? didn't she? Um, it looks like, according to Cage Match, all that stuff has been... Um, the couple of ones that she did in Japan were uh, the under the NJPW uh, Strong got it, got it. State uh, gimmick. So... Who, who just wrestled in Japan that, that, that I'm thinking of then? Didn't somebody... Oh, didn't somebody go over there and defend the... I thought she went over there and defend the TBS title. Um, not, I don't... It's not showing up. Um, hmm. Let me check Stat. I don't think Stat has. I can't, I can't recall reading about any um, Statlander Japan runs, but I could be wrong there too. Um... This is the part of the show where Fred does a Google. Yes. So uh, she wrestled in stardom this year. Uh, on oh, I was, I was looking May, at her ass. I'm yeah. May, May 18th, 2024, she beat Tom Nakano to defend the TBS title. So last month. Yeah. yeah there you go. All right. Page Matt well, listing it under World Wonder Ring Stardom, the proper name. <laughs> I'm just like, uh, yes, yeah. obviously. <laughs> I love it. All right, I love it. All right, folks, heat check. Pretty simple. Fred's going to read off the match, and we're just going to give a scale of 1 to 10 how excited we are and just talk about it, and then we can banter back and forth. Fred, do you have the match order up? I do. I do. Uh, we're going to skip away. the pseudo-announced women's tag that I just mentioned to get straight to a main event in any building. Oh, the women's tag, man. by the way, if we if we did it, would be like a nine for me. Like that's my most. Oh, that sounds really like, good. Although I've been my di- second or third most anticipated match on the whole show. So. I've been down on Watanabe the past year. It feels like she's entered like that, um, uh, like the show. Um, I'm not really trying, and now I'm in a heel group, so like it's going to get really bad kind of thing. Um, but otherwise, that match sounds pretty cool. But the, the real main event. So okay. give extra effort in America, I think. That's what's fine. I probably I would expect that, yeah. Um but okay, the real main event trios match, Samojo Hook and Katsuyori Shibata <laughs> against uh, CML representative Chris Jericho, uh Big Bill, who wrestled in Europe fifty times and is representing Rev Pro, I'm sure, and uh Brian Keith, uh DDT representative. We'll start Adam, you want to start here? Three. <laughs> I don't know, like pretty low. I'm sure it'll be fun. Like, like I don't think it'll be bad, but 
as John was saying, this match doesn't really belong on this show. Um, like they should just do that at Collision the night before. But I don't know. Like I don't, I'm sure it'll be fine. But yeah, it's not what we watched Forbidden Door for. And this could have been such an easy situation where they could have like had Chris Jericho be like, I'm bringing in two new branches of the learning tree and bring in insert names here of, you know, heel for hire people from CMLL or New Japan. And it just would have been the, the simplest thing. But this is what we got instead. So I'm in a one. I hate this. I'm at like a four. I, I do think it's cool that Brian Keith's going to get uh, a pay-per-view payday. Um I think this will be his first uh, like major booking outside of the the running he did at Double or Nothing. Like I think that's pretty cool, but man, they they could have done so much more. They really could have done so much more with what this match was. Just put put the learning tree against. And I know John had mentioned that some of the New Japan talent just did not want to pop over, which I completely understand. But this would have been a cool spot to be like, all right. The learning tree versus like um, Shota Umino, Yoda Suji, and Yuya Yumura. Even though they're all in different units, just be like, "Hey, go beat Chris Jericho's butt." And Shota at least has the the connection with Jericho from uh, Wrestle Kingdom, and then the the Forbidden Door match two years ago. But yeah, well, this this could have been Shota's spot if he wasn't very seriously injured. For all we know, <laughs> very true. Well, very serious injury. Hipxrays.com. Um, John, <laughs> one to ten, where are you at? Uh, negative something, I guess. Pick a number. <laughs> I, 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 I cannot stand the learning tree. I mean, I know some people love this. I just, it, I, it's like the, the biggest channel changing heat in the promotion for me right now. Um, the Joe team is cool. If this was on a normal AW pay per I'd probably be like a two. But on Forbidden Door, it's like negative 5,000. Very fair. I energy. love I love the negative energy. Hell yeah, this rocks. <laughs> well, let's change the energy because next up is a first round match in the uh, men's Owen Hart Cup tournament. It is Brian Danielson against Shingo Takagi. I'll go with John first. John, what do you um, I would put this at an eight. I guess I'm. You know, it's a cool match. It's not like it's a match I'm not going to be really excited to see. It's. These Owen matches with the New Japan guys always kind of feel like you already know the winner before they start. Um, so that being a new tradition, I don't really love. I feel like to really make that matter going forward, they're going to have to have the, the New Japan guy win and go on a run uh, in the yes. Owen at one point. But like the problem is obviously this is so close to the G1 for the New Japan side, and you don't really know how long they can let even a guy like Shingo. You know, Shingo has to be back in Japan to work the – the New Japan has a show the following weekend where they're working. A, he's working a big six-man tag with uh, Lij versus Lij in uh, Naito and Bushi's hometown. So I mean, you already know the result. Unfortunately, unless the only chance is if they have Shingo win and then lose to Pac on. I think they already said the winner's going to play with Pac on Wednesday. I guess that's possible in the, with the time frame, but it just sort of feels like until until I see a New Japan guy win one of these matches. I'm not going to really believe it's possible. So that is the main thing, tempering my excitement. Plus, Shingo's had a couple, like, I don't want to say sh- I'm on, like, oh, Shingo and Wasp or anything, but, like, he's had a couple performances recently that where I'm like, oh, that wasn't quite as good as I expected it to be. So, you know, he's not, I, I think he has very suddenly dropped a little bit off from, you know, his peak a few years ago, which, unfor- you know, really unfortunately, his peak was, uh, in New Japan was at the same time of, as clap crowds, obviously. So that's those are the two main factors tempering my excitement a little bit. But again, it's still a solid, very solid eight. It's still, you know, one of the few matches on the show I'm actually looking forward to. Um, but yeah, that that would be the the tempering factors for me. Tyler, where you got? I'm at a 30. I'm I'm just really really excited to see these guys get in the ring together. Obviously, the I think the only other time was that Ring of Honor show, and I think it was what 2007. Yeah, DG USA, DG USA, 2010. DG USA. Okay. Yeah. Man, it's just yeah, it's just cool, and I really think it would make sense for Shingo to get the win um, over Danielson, and then you get 
Shingo versus Pac. And Tony keeps saying, book for the sickos. Shingo versus Pac sounds pretty good. Um, and I don't think Danielson needs to be in the main event of All In. I, I think, especially with the potential of Nigel still looming, it, it feels like something's going to happen there. Wouldn't be shocked if it was more of a tag than the straight singles. But these two are just going to go out, and it's probably only going to be 15, 16 minutes, and they're just going to have a a war. They're just going to beat the ever-living piss out of each other. And it's going to be fantastic. I can't wait. Adam? Yeah, I'm right there with you, Tyler. Um, it, it, it's two of the greatest wrestlers and best wrestlers of all time. You know, um, Brian Danielson's in the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame. I expect Shingo Takagi to get in, uh, if not this year, um, in the in the coming years. So two of the absolute best ever. Brian knows he doesn't have that much longer left as a full-time wrestler with his, you know, self-imposed semi-retirement. He's probably never going to wrestle Shingo Takagi again. So this is his one shot. He's going to go all out. I, I have no doubt. And I'm sure Shingo is really excited uh, for this match again and uh, as well. And, you know, he's, he's going to do the same thing. So, yeah, I'd say this is probably... This might be the match actually I'm looking to the most, looking forward to the most on on this card. So yeah, you know, I'd put this at like a, you know a nine or a ten for for myself. Yeah, I'm at a ten as well. Uh, I'm really excited for this one. Uh, it's probably I don't know when I'm ever going to get to see that Enter the Dragon match because uh, thanks, Gabe. Uh, and uh, I, I, these are two of my all time favorite guys, so I'm really looking forward to this one. It should be a blast. I just hope they get at least fifteen minutes. You know, just to really. Do some cool stuff. If they uh, get, next... if they don't get at least fifteen minutes, Tony has to like get rid of that for the sickos trademark. That's sure. oh no, he will no longer be for the sickos. <laughs> He's going to be for the ones with like a common cold. <laughs> All right, our next match to discuss is um, uh, another uh, singles match. It is Hechicero against MJF. Uh, Tyler, I'm going to have you lead off on this one. I think build-wise, it feels a little weird, especially with Hechicero being with uh, the Gates of Agony and the Machine Brian Cage. Like, it, it, it just feels like an odd odd group there. But the idea of Hechicero and MJF facing off, to me, is really, really appealing. Um, I'd give it like an 8.5. I, I love Hechicero, he, and I think he's going to be one of those guys – that I think somebody related him to Tomohiro Ishii, where he's just going to be more over stateside than he is in his home promotion. And I think Hachisero has a really bright future continuing to come over here if he's taken care of. And having a great match with MJF, even in a loss, I think will be a really big step in making that happen. I'm I'm very excited because MJF, I thought, had a great match with Rouge last week. And now he gets Hachisero, who can do some of that same hard-hitting physical style, but also has uh, the ability to be a submission expert, as we saw in that match with uh, Zack Sabre Jr. this past weekend at, in CMLL. I think this could be fantastic. And it, this is the perfect kind of forbidden door match on the mid card, where it's just two dudes who are really good from different promotions going out and having a match. I love this. Uh, Adam? Yeah, I'm actually higher on this, I think, than most. I'd probably put this at like a seven or, or eight. Um, MJF, he's he's a better technical wrestler than, remember he had that match a couple of years ago with, I think it was Jungle Boy on, I want to say, Full Gear. Um, they did a lot of chain wrestling and stuff. So I'm I'm actually really looking, uh, really looking forward to this one. I think it could be surprisingly good. From the build perspective, I agree. There's not a whole lot to it. It seemed like... You know, maybe Roosh was supposed to be the pay-per-view match, but then, you know, Roosh couldn't be on Forbidden Door for a variety of reasons. Um, so they just did that on TV and then like, oh, Hechicero, you know, people really like him. Um, he's really good. He could make for a great match and just kind of plugged him in. And uh, I'm going to disagree with you, Tyler. I think his alignment with Brian Cage makes perfect sense because if anyone needs an alchemist, whether it's replacing spare parts or finding some sort of chemical elixir to maintain that physique, it's Brian Cage. So 
I perfectly All right. understandable why he'd bring uh, Hechicero into the group. That's All right, you got me there. That was tremendous. That's very good. I'm going to have John go next so I don't say anything that gets me in trouble. Um, I, I'm going to say seven for this, too. I, I, this is like the exact type of match that I wish there was like two or three more of on this card where you have the outside guy against an AW guy and you're just going to go out there and wrestle. I mean, if they replaced that six-man tag at the ladder match with like two more of these, the show would actually be good. So, you know, this is – MJF has been – the match of Roots is really good. You know, his wrestling is not the problem with MJF for me. It's, it's some of his creative instincts that we saw and some of his promos. But, you know, I, I don't doubt – and plus he'll be super, super over in Long Island anyway. So it should be a lot of fun. I'm going to say seven. The build has been I'm nothing. Going, but. Yeah, it's a, it's a really weak build, but I'm at an 8-1 because I think both guys are really good and I'm excited to see what they do together. But two, I think this is a big put-up-or-shut-up match for MJF. Uh, and we're going to have a lot of those, I think, for the rest of this year just because of last year and how everything went. Um, but I, you know, I think MJF is, you know, after last year, I'm really tempted to say MJF's a better wrestler than he is a talker just in terms of, like, the creative aspect of everything. And so we don't have to have him nailing kids with a volley or a, a, a kickball for 20 minutes you know uh on a random dynamite uh so yeah i hope this works out well and I'm, I'm looking forward to this one i think it'll be really good all right our next match is a singles match for the iwgp world heavyweight championship with the challenger tetsuya naito and the champion john moxley i'm going to lead off with the ultimate tetsuya naito uh respecter john here john the floor is yours I mean, it's a nine because I, I can't wait to see Knight to win the belt back. And I think there's pretty much no chance he loses. I mean, if he loses, everybody's lost. Their, everybody in New Japan's lost their goddamn minds at that point. So I just do not. Uh, for anyone listening who doesn't get it, there's no way this man is <laughs> coming out of the G1. They're not taking their biggest domestic draw off their biggest tour uh, to replace him with John Moxley, even if AW would let him do that, unless, like, his neck is broken or something. So, you know, Naito's going to win. I'm excited to see that. The only reason why I'm not going 10 is because, um, you know, I've seen the match live already this year. I saw it in uh, Chicago already at, when I went to Windy City Riot. And the build has been, like, absolutely nothing. I honestly cannot believe how – like, you can't even run a fucking video package about the guy or something. They haven't said anything about this match. It's incredible to me. I, I assume they're finally going to do something tonight with the other LIJ people in there, but like there's been nothing on AWTV at all. You'd have no idea this match was even happening if you didn't look at the screen when they uh, ran down the card because they've had no other build, nothing to do. I, I don't know if this is a case where like, okay, well, we know Moxley is going to lose, so let's play down the match as much as possible or what, but it's pretty fucking stupid. So that, that's that been horrible. Just like no build at all. Like why not just put a subtitle promo from Naito on the on the screen or something like I, I don't really get it but they've done nothing so that's that's the only reason why it's not a 10 uh, I can't wait to see Naito win the IWGP title in person for the third time in my life so hopefully they'll have uh, Naito come out of the crowd and hit a Destino or something tonight uh, frankly because it's it's been a really bad build um, I guess I'll just use this opportunity to get my number which is an 8 I think it'll be a really good match I think the build has been pretty damn non-existent for it though and one of the weaker aspects of this card uh, Adam your turn yeah I'll go with 8 as well um, you know expect, fully expect Naito to win I have a question for John on this um, what what do Japanese fans think about and I guess there's a little bit of projection involved here but what did they think about, you know, Naito losing the title to Moxley in America, Moxley, you know, having some defenses in Japan, and then losing the title back to Naito back in America? Um, do I they didn't... care at all? Or is like, uh... is it positive or negative? The only thing I saw that they got really mad about is when Moxley defended the title on Dynamite against Powerhouse Hobbs. They got really, really mad about that because... Um, there were a lot of posts to the effect of this weakens the IWGP. If a guy who's not even, you know, a main event in his own company can challenge for it, doesn't this make the IWGP look lesser? Like they, they really hated that. I really did not see very many complaints about the title change. Um, 
or the um, so yeah, the title, the original title change, or like the fact that the title match, the rematch is in America. I didn't really see any complaints about, you know, I mean, a few about the original title change, but I haven't really seen anybody complaining about uh, doing the rematch in America. Um, but yeah, the, like I said, the big complaint, like I was talking about earlier, is why Moxie was not announced for the G1 if he's still IWGP champion. So the timing of that has been their big complaint. Mm. They've been a lot of complaints on Twitter about that. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I'm a Naito fan, so I'll be excited to uh, to see him uh, to, to see him win it again. So yeah, I, I'd say about an eight for myself. I am. I'm at a nine. I did like Naito going to Tokyo Sports and saying, "Well, if I lose, he can be in the G1 at least." Like that probably should have been thought of a little bit earlier. But all the credit in the world to Naito for you know making that happen just because uh, I think that little tidbit for maybe some people will say, Oh, maybe Moxley is going to win now. Uh, we all know he's not. And Naito's winning this title, unless there's some kind of injury we just don't know about. But uh, the idea of, of Naito just being like, yeah, I'll just skip the G1 this year. I'm going to, I'll go home and relax. I, I just think it's absolutely hilarious. Um, this match could be really, really good. Um, I hope we get, full effort Naito and Naito's health is in a really good spot. Cause when it is, he can really deliver big time. And overall, I, I just think this, is, this will be good. Um, the one thing that I'll say about the build, it reminds me of the IWGP build from a couple years ago when Jay White just came out on that Milwaukee dynamite the Wednesday before and told Adam Cole, he couldn't challenge for the title. And then all of a sudden, Hangman Page and Kazuchika Okada come out, and all of a sudden, now we have a four-way. Uh, I, I kind of feel like they're putting the build on the back burner for this in a similar way. Um, I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. I think it's a bad thing. But it, it, I, I just think it reminded me of that when I was kind of thinking about it and how they've really structured things. Kind of sucks. It's, yeah, I think it seemed like – they probably have something planned for when like the LIJ guys were actually going to be in the building live. And they're just like, okay, we have this on the go home show. Like when, you know, mm-hmm. when they're actually going to be here live. So they just kind of earmarked that like, Oh, that's when we're really going to go and promote this. And we'll just focus on other stuff before then. But yeah, it, it kind of, I don't know. It doesn't build. I don't know. We'll see what the angle is and um, how, how strong it is, but. Yeah, I agree. It would have been nice if they did a little bit more. I mean, Moxley did cut that promo where he was, I think he said he was going to murder Naito and bury him, which is a little strong. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I was like, yeah, what, do, what, do you ever, what do you ever do to you, buddy? I know. Weird. It's like, dude, you beat him. Like, he, what is, he hasn't really done anything to, to warrant that. But uh, all, right, all right. I guess he just really loves being the IWGP champion. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll, yeah, I think that's what it was. They just had like an angle plan for the go home show or and the collision before probably, um, and just kind of left it at that. So yeah, it ends up being underwhelming, but the match will probably be excellent, and it'll seem like uh, you know it'll seem like a significant, definitely a significant match, especially if there's a title change and the crowd will be happy with it. Also, is there going to be the roll call or not? Is another question, especially since I doubt it's going to go on last. It's an AEW pay per view, so I'm going to say no. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably not. Which I'm already people, probably... people are going to complain about the Naito fan believes. He's going to start the roll call. Uh, Excalibur will run down five matches for Dynamite, and then uh, they'll <laughs> run out of pay per view time. Um, Speaking of Dynamite, so... um, apparently we're going to have Osprey versus Daniel Garcia next week in Chicago, I believe, for the international title. Hmm. That'll be a good match. Uh, that's the strongest take I could possibly make, I know, but I, I think that'll be pretty <laughs> damn fun. I'm very proud of you. Um, uh, speaking of uh, for the sickos, uh, AW opened this week with a Daniel Garcia promo segment, so we're going to really see what this rating is for the sickos <laughs> after <laughs> last week. Oh, but that, uh, that, our, that rating last week, man! I don't. Oh, I, I that don't was even, so weird, I don't especially even get with that. like. Collision being normal, if I'm not mistaken, like yeah, it was like four, it was like it was above average for collision, wasn't it? It was like yeah, four hundred twelve thousand or something. 
Well, it's I like, appreciate really, you guys was, coming on the the last episode of this podcast. <laughs> it's definitely going to die imminently. Um, just a really weird, really weird number. Um, but we'll see how tonight's does. Uh, that'll be really interesting when those numbers come out. And uh, here comes yeah. Shingo, uh, bet, the absolute I've, worst. I bet discourse. it's the exact. I bet it's the exact same number they always do this week. My prediction. Yeah, it's like the it's old like, TNA GIF with a 1.0 scrolling past, like with yeah. Money. It'll be like it'll be like 750 or something. Yeah. All right, our next match is a rematch from last year, unless my brain is completely smooth, which it may be. Uh, Orange Cassidy, Zack Saber Jr. So it was a four. Uh, it was a four way last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, see, yeah. This was the match everybody was wanted right. last year, and they gave okay, us the four way. Like I said, I'm dumb as hell. Uh, Adam, you want to take this one first? Yeah, I'll go with like a seven uh, for this one. I think the match will be really good. I think their styles complement each other uh, pretty well. Also, Orange is incredibly flexible, so I'm like looking forward to some oh, like be some sicko stuff there. <laughs> yeah, just Real like some pleasure. really crazy contortionist submission stuff going on with this one. Uh, so yeah, that, that's what I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Uh, Tyler, I'm at an eight. Like, I think uh, we talked about Orange Cassidy earlier in the show. How the the unfavorable uh, booking of him after the John Moxley loss. I just think that Tony Khan thinks this is his peak, and he's never going to get past it. While some of us thought, hey, he's he has a chance to like skyrocket into like the next level stardom. I just don't think that AEW ever had that plan for him, which we could argue whether that's good or bad, but when given the opportunity against the right opponent, Orange Cassidy's great. Two years ago at Forbidden Door is against Will Ospreay. And we kind of turned our noses against it and like, oh, this is how you're going to use Will Ospreay. Well, that match was phenomenal. and I gave it five stars. I loved it. And you have a guy like Zack Sabre Jr. As Adam mentioned, Orange Cassidy is very flexible. Zack Sabre Jr. is, the, in my opinion, the most unique wrestler on the planet. And I'm really excited to see what these guys can do. It's going to be completely different from anything else on the card. And it could steal the show. Like, I, I don't think it's going to be better than Swerve and Osprey because those two have proven to have good chemistry and they're going to want to be a match of the year. But this has a chance to be truly, truly great. Yeah, uh, just to mention it real quick, uh, or do mine real quick, I, I'm pretty excited for this one, 8 out of 10. I think it has a very high ceiling uh, and a pretty relatively high floor. Um, I'm curious to see how they do together. Uh, John? Uh, so I'm going to be the grump. I'm a 5 on this. It's probably the lowest I can go in a match I think will be good. But, like, we just saw this pairing last year, you know? I mean, I know they didn't have a singles match, but they wrestled each other in a, four, a tag match and a four-way, you know, within about a week. So I feel like I got my fill of this pairing, especially for, you know, an interpromotional thing. And I would have much rather seen Zack Sabre Jr. face somebody else on this giant AEW roster, you know, full of great wrestlers. So uh, it's definitely a five for me. I just, I'm not, I think this is a pretty big waste of using Zack, even though, I, you know, it's, it'll be a good match. Uh, it's, not like I'm, it's not like I'm like dreading watching it or anything. I'm just not particularly excited. And I think there's, the opportunity cost here was high for me, where I think I'd rather, I would have rather seen Zach face, I don't know, Darby Allen or somebody. All right. Uh, our next match is a winner takes all uh, match for the AEW TBS Championship and the New Japan Strong Women's Championship. We have Mercedes Monet, Stephanie Bakir. Uh, Tyler, as a uh, woman respecter, uh, you can take this one first. Oh, I would have loved this way more if this was Willow Knight and Gale in the spot. Um, I, I'm, I'm at a six. I think the match can be good uh, to really good. I just, I kind of just don't care. I'm over Mercedes already in this company. Like, she's good. I I just don't have any real investment. Um, I don't have much exposure to Vicar at all, so I'm going to be really excited to kind of watch her. But... Until Mercedes gets a, a little less fed pill, I, I think I'm just going to be more um, agnostic about her appearing on these shows. Fair enough. Uh, John? I'm a seven. Uh, I don't know how many of you watched their match last year, but they had a first round match in the Strong Women's Tournament uh, in Long Beach, um, which only went about 12 minutes. So. You know, unlike with the pairing I just talked about with Orange and Zach, I felt like I'm left wanting more here. 
and you know they 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 had a real great twelve minute match. It was probably like a four star match. So you know I think the two of them have a they wrestle kind of a similar style. Um, you know they both like to take big risks. I think it could be a really good match again. Um, hoping they get a little more time this time. And it's one of the only matches on the show where I legitimately have no idea who's going to win. You know, I think both girls could easily win and become a double champion. So, you know, I, I would still, I would say Monet, I, uh, Monet should be favored, but it wouldn't shock me at all if Stephanie beats her and then Money has to get her win back uh, to win back the PBS title or something. So, yeah, I'm like a seven on this. I'm, I'm, I'm into it. I am, uh, I'm looking forward to this, but I, you know, I'm just kind of eh on it at the same time. So I'm at like a, a six and a half, I guess. Uh, I really liked that match last year. I went four on it. I just, I don't know. Mercedes and AEW has yet to fully win me over, even though I think her, her in-ring work has been great so far. Um, and I think maybe she's figuring out how to not be actively awful, uh, out of the ring. Um, so, yeah, uh, this will probably be better than that, but I'm still just kind of like, eh, when it comes to it. So, Adam. Yeah, I'll say a seven as well. Uh, there's not really a storyline going into this. It's just kind of, hey, we're going to have this interpromotional match, champion versus champion. Uh, they seem to have good chemistry, like from their match last year. And I think the match will probably end up being very good. It's... I guess I'm a little bit more optimistic about Mercedes, I think, than you guys are. Uh, it seemed like her being injured and not being able to wrestle, like, kind of forced her to do all these different types of that, uh, you know, do certain types of non-wrestling segments with her for a very long time, which is not her strong suit. Um, and it seems like since then, they're more focused on just, you know, having her go out there and have matches or do more physical angles. Um, so I'm a little bit more optimistic about where she goes from here. I just think it was an unfortunate start uh, that she had. Uh, I fully expect her to win, though. I don't think they're going to beat her for a while. Um, and, you know, whoever does is probably going to, like, definitely get a very strong push for it. So I'll say, like, overall anticipation probably about, like, a seven. But I, I definitely think the match is going to be excellent. All right, and that leaves us with two matches left. Uh, ne next to last is a ladder match for the vacant AEW TNT Championship. Uh, Soup Takeshita, Mark Briscoe, Jack Perry, Dante Martin, Leo Rush, and the Ever Dangerous to be de determined or announced, as I try to say both at the same time. I am very good at podcasting. Uh, Adam, I'm going to go right back to you for this one. Uh, what are your feelings on this one? Uh, five. I don't know. Like, it'll... <laughs> It's just a ladder. It's a multi-man ladder match. Like I think they've had AEW has a ladder match on like I want to say they've like four of the last five or five of the last six, something like that. Pay-per-views. There's a ladder match on every single one. And this one, like I understand the title's vacant and a ladder match is like they're already gonna do a tournament with the Owen Hart, you know, the Owen Hart tournament. So they didn't want to do another tournament to like uh, you know, decide who the TNT champion was gonna be, but I don't know, especially with Forbidden Door and, you know, it just seems like they could have come up with something better than just throwing a ladder match on it filled with AEW guys. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I'm sure it'll be entertaining. And, you know, they always have one plunder match on an AEW pay-per-view. So I'm sure the match will deliver and be good. But I'm just not. And also, we all kind of know Jack Perry is winning, right? Unless, you know, to be determined is... Uh, <laughs> someone really unexpected but yeah i don't know well we'll see it'll probably be good but i'm not really like excited looking forward to it that's a five for me john it's a one uh i'm looking forward to using the bathroom getting some chicken tenders anything else i feel like doing during this match because i do not ever want to see a multi-person ladder match for the rest of my life if possible that's all I have to say about this one. No business on Forbidden Door at all, as Adam just said. Uh, Tyler. I'm at a five. I think it's going to end up being good. Anytime AEW does these multi-person ladder matches, they're good. I just, I don't care. Um, and I will say this. I would not be shocked if the uh, aforementioned X is Hangman Page. Because if you're not going to put him in the Owen, if you put him in the Owen, I think you have to have him win it. 
And if you don't put him in the Owen, you have to reintroduce him at some point. And this could be the way to like screw over Jack Perry and Hangman the, draws the line in the sand and he continues. Uh, there's, I guess, he starts his arc of the feud with the elite. And I, I guess I'm intrigued from that standpoint. Dante Martin's going to do some bonker stuff. Leo Rush could do some bonker stuff. I, I just don't care. I really don't. I am intrigued to see Takeshita in a ladder match scenario because I don't know if he's been in one of these before in AEW. Uh, I, I think that could be really interesting, but I'm with John. Go get chicken tenders. Like th- that's that's a tremendous life decision. In my opinion, the best thing to catch chicken do in this match is pull a full Ricky Starks and just be like, "Look, I ain't doing this. No thanks." Um, because that was just one of the funniest things I've, I've ever seen. Yeah. Oh yeah, just to like 100 percent be like, you know, I could be really dumb, but I won't. So thank you. Um, I have the grade that's... one climax to come. I'm yeah. not gonna like like if he gets injured this fucking ladder match. Right oh god. He won. Oh. Imagine the six person game kid replaces <laughs> his re- his replacement is Lance Archer, um, which wouldn't be bad. It's just you know that Lance Archer seems permanently stuck in the well. New Japan needs a guy, and I don't want to send him anyone else. Got spot. Um, yeah. Well, so, Tekestic uh, is probably going mean, to murder always... Leo Rush in this match, though. Like he's gonna he's gonna throw him so high or suplex, oh, do yeah. some sort of crazy suplex on Leo Rush, like for sure. I'll say too. It's... The Lance Archer thing is also because he volunteers to go every time. Like he oh, wants sure. yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like it's he not wants a knock on, on Archer at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. But like, like Archer's not doing anything for AEW, obviously. And that's that's another problem, not with Archer, yeah. but with Tony Khan. Um, yeah. uh, it's just that he, it'll be like, hey, you guys need someone? Because like, <laughs> I'm not doing anything, man. Yeah. So. And New Japan always will take him because he's over in Japan. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to let a little secret slip here. I, still kind of love these dumb ladder matches i know they're really dumb i i know they're overdone but i do really like like dante martin and mark briscoe and leo rush falling off stuff it still it gets to my lizard brain it, it works for me that way uh i don't care if it makes me sound really dumb i i know that like everyone else in voices is like as a discerning wrestling viewer i have seen entirely too many of these and i'm just like i'm a real dumb guy <laughs> fall off stuff yeah I, it was so, never been the. They've never been the same for me since I went to the MSG show uh, with my partner Nicole, who's not oh, really like a wrestling the, fan. The yeah. Ring of Honor one. The oh, Ring of okay, Honor match. Set, it went like a that half really hour. Weird. Madison like Square Taven, baby. Yeah, it went like a half hour, and she just kept looking at me and being like, "Why won't any of these people just climb up there and get the belt?" <laughs> and I had to be like, "I don't, sweetheart. This is how it goes. These wrestling matches. They they just they pretend they can't climb." And she just kept complaining for the entire runtime. Like, why would they just grab it? I just never every every time I watch these matches now, I just think, why wouldn't they just grab it? I just it's all all my brain goes to. So she ruined them for me forever. Not that, that I really reminds me that much. But... Oh, go ahead, Adam. You say okay, but a a guy in the crowd got hit with a ladder during that match. That's true. So... I forgot about that. <laughs> That's like one of the worst like big title matches on a big show of all time. That thing is so horrible. I mean, that, it's uh, hilarious in retrospect, but yeah, it was not fun to sit through. No. Oh, that was a really bad match. One of the worst of the year. Um, that uh, John story reminds me of the time that I I begged Nicole to let me watch a wrestling match uh, one night just to because I just got this DVD I really wanted to watch and I already watched like two of the matches off it, but I hadn't watched the third. And I hadn't really done any like research into what the third match was, and it was the CM Punk Smojo Ring of Honor feud. And uh, she didn't really appreciate that hour long match, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> uh, for the breaking of- news, oh. Tetsuya Naito is on dynamite. Well, I, I'm, I hope so. I was apparently say, in his gear. Oh, well. oh t shirt um, or no? For the people, listening, I, I don't know. <laughs> for the people listening at home, I wanted to clarify uh, Fred and I are not in a polyamorous relationship with a girl named Nicole. It's two different Nicoles. Two different I think Nicoles. anyone anyone who went to school in our time period is aware of there being multiple Nicoles, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> at the same time period yeah. as we were going through like middle school. Um I hit like all right. I hit like all the common girl names. Like I had a, my ex girlfriend 
uh, it was Emily, I had an Ashley, now Nicole, it's like all the super common girl names. Nowadays, hey, I, I, nowadays I'd be dating like Diamond and like uh, like all these crazy names like Flower or Nevea. Uh, Nevea, there you go. It's heaven backwards. It, um, hey, I, I get it, John. My, my wife is Caitlin, and my ex girlfriend is Jess. Yeah, I did, I did a Caitlin too, actually. The name collector, uh, John Carroll. <laughs> All right, our final match to talk about is the main event. It is for the AEW World Championship. It is Will Osprey challenging for Strickland. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys not just for your rating for this one, but I, I think this is the most interesting one in terms of a creative decision at the end of the night. Uh, who do you think's going over, and who do you think should go over? Uh, Tyler, I'd like you to lead this one off. I look. I'm at a nine and a half for this. I'm really excited to see what these two can do at this stage in their careers. I love that you finally have a world title match on one of these shows that truly feels that it can go either way. I would prefer that it be a interpromotional match for the AEW world title, but you never got the feeling that, Jay White was going to lose the belt in the four way. You never got the feeling that Moxley was going to lose to Tanahashi. Uh, you never got the feeling that either MJF or Sonata were losing last year. And Naito feels like a shoe in to beat Moxley. This really feels 50 50. And you could argue that Swerve should hold the title because you're trying to make a guy. Osprey loves to lose to people to make them. And then you can have Hangman Page if he's not the. the ever dangerous X here. He could be the ever dangerous X in the Owen. And then you main event with one of the biggest feuds you've had in AEW over the last couple of years, Hangman Page or Source Strickland at Wembley. Or you could go with Will Ospreay because he's arguably the greatest wrestler in the world. He's massively over with this crowd. And you have the Brit going to headline Wembley Stadium. Like you could go either way and I could easily support it. I think Will Ospreay is going to win. I've thought since Ospreay won the opportunity to get this title that Tony Khan wanted to have him with two belts. And he wanted to have him defending both belts regularly like a champion should. And I think that that's the story that they're going to give. I don't think it's going to hurt Swerve very much because I think Swerve is going to look incredible in, in defeat. But I, I'm not that confident that that's the story they're going to tell. I, I really don't know, but I'm excited to see what happens. And it's it's just a breath of fresh air on one of these shows. Even if, as we talked about earlier, it's an AEW versus AEW match, a title match feels up in the air. I like that. Quick note before I advance forward, a Rovert tweet I'd like to read. Uh, Tony Khan read Voices Wrestling 30 Under 30 2024 list and chose violence. All right. Uh, Adam, I'm going to go with you next. Uh, your thoughts on the match, uh, 1 to 10, and uh, who you think will win and who should win. Yeah, uh, I'm a Tyler, 9.5, I would say. Like, really excited for this one. I think it's going to be absolutely tremendous. Um, in terms of who's going to win, I don't have as much doubt about the outcome. I think Swerve is definitely winning this um, for a couple different reasons. One, I don't think, like, in terms of Osprey becoming the champion, like it feels like that has to be at Wembley, right? For the first time, like whether it's this year or next year, it'd be kind of weird just to have him win it before Wembley and then defend there. I mean, you could do it, but the other thing that makes me think he's makes me think he's losing is the whole angle with the Tiger Driver. You know, him hesitating to use the Tiger Driver. It seems like they would like they they did that to give him an out for a loss. And then he's going to have some sort of redemption arc to redeem himself where he won't be hesitating to use it in the future. So I expect him to like hesitate um, to use the Tiger Driver, which leads to him losing. And then uh, whether he is the wild card in the Owen and they do it like they have him headline against Swerve in a rematch uh, this year, I could definitely see that. Or, you know, maybe their plan is to do it next year. Um, and he's going to be doing something else at Wembley, and then the wild card ends up being Hangman, and they do Swerve and Hangman uh, at Wembley. It seems like Swerve's definitely going to get pulled into that elite program, 
uh, at some point. Like he's already had some back and forth with them and, you know, Hangman's history with the elite. It just seems like that's the natural direction. I guess the question is more just kind of when does that happen and is he world champion uh, when that happens or not? So, uh, yeah, I definitely expect Swerve to win this match, but I expect it to be an absolutely incredible match. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, the follow-up after it, which could go in a variety of different directions. I'm excited to see. And John, I'll allow you. I'm like a, sorry? Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I'm like a six. I don't know. I mean... I don't agree that it's not at all obvious who's winning this match. The problem is that Swerve has way too much left to do as champion. I mean, I do not think he's losing this belt and without doing the Hangman title match. And Osprey has a lot to do without being champion, given that he's international champion and that he, um, you know, has the Don Callis family break up still to come, which this is the bi- that's the biggest problem with this title match to me since the moment they first booked it. Is it feels too, it felt really rushed. First of all, it felt too early uh, for Osprey. Get, given also given where Swerve was, was in his reign, so it kind of gets him into a situation where if Osprey loses, you know, you're risking cooling him off. But if Swerve loses, you know, you're cutting off his title reign really quickly, and he's going to get kind of a, a label as having this failed short title reign with you know attendances and ratings both dropping. So. It's kind of a lose-lose match to me. I, it's not good booking. Uh, yes, the match should be good. I mean, obviously, that's Will Ospreay and Swerve Strickland. So that I, as far as me being in the building to see it, that's cool. But I don't exactly think – I can't say I'm hyped for it because the booking feels so really weak to me, and it, the result does feel pretty obvious. for beyond the, And then on, on top of that, you have the fact that, you know, it doesn't really belong on Forbidden Door. It's the world title match, so – all adds up to six for me. I'm at a eight and a half, I think, with this one. Uh, my reasoning being, I do think it'll be a damn good match. I think it's a pretty good main event that AEW can put on. I do wish it was a proper forbidden door match, but I'm willing. I would be willing to let it slide if they weren't doing stuff like the the Learning Tree versus Hook and Shibata and Samoa Cho on the pre-show, which I assume it'll be. I hope that's on the pre-show. Good lord, imagine if that wasn't. Um, I don't but, think it is. I don't know if it is, but yeah. Uh, um, not good. Um, I will say that um, I think this match will rock, but I I also think that they're going to make a bad call with putting Swerve over. Uh, and it's not a knock on Swerve. I just feel like at this point in time in AEW, I think a lot of people feel really cold right now, which is actually really unique for the promotion because even when previously they were kind of struggling uh, I think the people they had, they had people that felt hot. And I think Fox is really cold. I think Danielson's really cold. I think um, uh, Joe has cooled. Um, Adam Cole is frozen and ice like Captain America right now. Um, I, I just think a lot of people are much cooler than ever. And I don't think anyone in this company has felt hot, with the exception of Will Ospreay. Now, my concern is that we may be like a month past the strike while the iron is hot point with Osprey. I I, I do worry that maybe we've already seen kind of the peak of that with his coming in and being hot. But I I think that this is a clear cut to me situation where you have to put the belt on Osprey. And I, and I, I like Swerve a lot, you know, Tyler and I have talked about this a lot, but you know, at the start of last year, uh, we both were like, you need to strap up Swerve shortly. And instead we got the British Hachos. So, um, but yeah, I just think this is uh, this is they they've kind of I, I can't say booked themselves into a corner because I don't think either decision is truly bad, but I do worry that they're booking themselves into kind of a trap, and uh, I think that's a concern. So that's just kind of yeah, my like, take on this it. Should have, like this should have been the main event. That the part I don't get is why this isn't the main event for one. It's going to be a I really guess. really interesting show. And I'm fascinated to see what else they add. I think Tyler is uh, all, all messed up. Oh, hey, Tyler. John was saying something real quick. <laughs> oh. uh, all I was saying is I don't get why this isn't the Wembley main event, I guess. But that's- I think it I, could. 
I think it could be still, it might not be, but I think the idea here is this is going to be Osprey's big disappointment. And then this creates his emotional arc for, you know, whether it's, you know, whether his rise is in like two months or, you know, 14 months um, or maybe sometime in between. Right. Uh, Or maybe sometime in between. I I think this is the, I think like this is going to be the thing that then, it kind of pushes him forward and gets more of like a storyline um, going. So like there builds more anticipation for him to really win it. Cause so far he's just kind of been like Goldberg. Like he just kind of beats everybody like in awesome matches, which is great. Um, but I, I, it doesn't seem like that's the direction that they're going with him. Just steamrolling everybody. If he didn't have this tiger driver thing holding over, him i i could see like yeah maybe he is just going to steamroll everybody but i really think they did that for a reason and that's going to be like his achilles heel and then he's going to overcome that at some point in the future it's a really stupid achilles heel but i guess that's a different conversation yeah 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 I, <laughs> brian danielson's fine he's wrestling shingo on this show he's he's so okay, Bri- Will. danielson's fine and you have another move from the same position that also beats lots of people why not just do that yeah, and he was like holding the guy there for like ten hours. Like, oh, should I do it, bro? I'm like, just hit the store breaker. What are you doing? Yeah, I've never uh, liked that aspect where you use like uh, multiple power moves from the same position. Like Tomer here, Ishi, in my opinion, should never do a normal suplex because he uses the brain buster. Like it, I, it just it bugs me. It looks weird. Like, it, it'd it's be like, why one, you like just, I, yeah. I kind of get it because it's supposed to be a super finisher, but we don't need to make a whole story out of it. Yeah, it's, it's I, fine. I, it's fine for him to have two a finisher and a super finisher that use the same setup. The problem is when you then do a story where you don't want to hit your super finisher. All I'm left doing is screaming at my TV. Well, why don't you just hit the Stormbreaker? Then you have him in the same position. Right? That, yeah. that like that was so annoying. That was what the mm-hmm. match with Roger where he was doing that. But anyway. My prediction for the booking of this match is, is Swerve's going to go over. This will cause Will being turned on by the Callis family. Will will fight through the Callis family uh, and also overcome his fear of paralyzing people, I guess. Uh, it just in time to earn another title match for uh, All In. And uh, he'll win in Wembley. But I think that's too complicated personally. Uh, I just put the belt on him. Uh, but yeah, I guess that's the show. Uh, any other thoughts from anyone? Sorry, I'm so negative, everybody. Don't hate me. <laughs> you're not that You're not that negative. I will say, it is funny, though, that we... We're like, yeah, we're a little underwhelmed with the build and stuff, but there's really only two... I mean, John was a little bit harder on it than the rest of us, but uh, we're really... There's really only just two matches that we don't like. Um that, that for months, everything else we're relatively fine with. It's more just like we wanted, we don't like those two matches and we wish like they were replaced with more interpromotional matches and a higher variety of talent. So, yeah, look, again, if, this AW- was called, if this show was called like AEW Pride, Pride Month Bonanza or something, this would be like uh, like an eight out of 10 pay per view card. It's just that it's not a good for Ben Door card, I guess, is my yeah. point. Yeah, so I mean, I, I the pay per views are always great. So I, I expect the show will, will will be great too. It's more just like you know, there's a couple of things on the margins that could have like you know taken this from being like a seven or eight from um, level of anticipation to more of a nine or a ten for the overall show. I think the matches will be great. I just think that I honestly do think that like the TV build for everything that isn't Swerve and Osprey has been really missing, frankly, uh, except for Tony. Uh, Mina Shirakawa. Um, and, um, Wait, did we do that match? I don't think we did. I don't think do you we guys did. Really want to? Yeah. <laughs> I just remember I, that. I'm like, wait a second. I do. I okay, do go ahead, Adam. <laughs> I, I'm really excited for this match. Like, I I think I'll put it at like an eight. Um, okay. I think the match is going to be great. And I think this is like one of the better stories, AEW's like storylines AEW's told because – they established the Mina um, Mariah relationship gradually, and then uh, like just kind of set up a situation where Mina and Tony are now gonna you know fight for the title, and Mariah's stuck in the middle of it. 
I liked how they set that up gradually. And it seems like it's definitely part of a very detailed plan that they have for, you know, Mariah to win the Owen and then face Tony at, uh, at all in. So yeah, I'm, I'm really into this. And I think this is like one of the, from a creative and booking standpoint, I think this is one of the, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say the best things AEW has done this year, but it's one of the better things that uh, they've booked this year for sure. John? I would go seven um, only because I still don't love the Tony gimmick. That's really the only thing holding it back for me. And it does feel incredibly obvious Tony's going to win. But other than that, you know, I'm excited. And it has been built really well. Just wish we didn't have to. If, if they would just not do the black and white for anything except for entrance, it'd be so yeah. much better. But that's still the, the major thing holding it back for me. But other than that, it's good. Um, it's actually kind of one of the matches we forgot too, but I'll, I'll wait till you guys do that first. Tyler? I'm at an eight. I think this could be really good. I'm actually a little bit surprised that they haven't talked more about boobs for this match. Um, but I, I, it's just two really, really good workers who, if they decide they, they want to work, it could be really, really good. I'm worried that it's going to get too shtick heavy toward the end, and especially with the Mariah May stuff. It feels like they're finally starting to really – uh, move that storyline forward with uh, her potential split with Tony. But I, I, I don't know, man. I, I think this could be really good if they both want to have their working shoes on. I'm cautiously optimistic about the match quality. I actually, John, I, I swore that this match would be ending in um, in Mina winning, to be frank, uh, with Mariah oh, really? stabbing her in the back. I just personally, uh, that may huh. be too optimistic for Shira Collis taking around. Uh, that could be entirely me. Now, I will say that the build to this match has been the equivalent of the nerd in fifth grade typing 531 <laughs> into their calculator and then giggling as they flip it around. But um, yeah, I, I think this will be a really good match. Both, uh, both Tony and Mina are really good workers. This is one for all the Yuri fans out there, that is for sure. <laughs> <laughs> they're Rossi's like Rossi somewhere buying ten <laughs> pay per views. Rossi um, is Rossi is like out there right now trying to get some dojinchi writer on this, and like <laughs> he's ready to see some uh, fan works about this relationship. Uh, I think that's it. Okay, I've no, checked the card. One more, we've now, one more match. We've done everything. Oh. How, what, what am I missing now? Uh, Jeff Cobb has an open challenge for the New Japan World oh. Television title. This was on the card on Wikipedia last time I checked. I just checked now and it's gone. So I don't yeah, know if that's because that. I don't know if it's because the they, they think uh, they think it's not happening. But yes, Cobb has been calling out the entire AEW roster for the last six weeks, and the, the AEW roster has been completely ignoring it. So. I, I don't know if that is if Cobb is shooting his own angle here and uh, just wants to make the entire uh, AW roster look like they're scared of him or if they're finally going to announce something as the last possible second or what. But yes, we're, he's been challenging them in every backstage promo for like six weeks straight. So there you go. And uh, this is uh, maybe he and maybe he could also get Great Okan that match with Okada. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, kind of funny because like you also make your title look kind of like worthless when you do this so it's like a real double yes. sword yeah, so like is. nope like the entire roster doesn't want your weird friggin rectangle title I guess but, but yeah I don't know this would be a good opportunity to, to hear Dan Housen's awesome theme one more time um, <laughs> we aren't going to um, I mean I, I heard a rumor a while ago it was going to be Shane Taylor but then they just have it which to me it's, that's screen pre-show match but yeah, like one hundred percent. But like that's obviously they still haven't announced it for some reason. So at this point, I'm like, is it just nobody? I don't know. But yeah, I just wanted to bring it up because I, it's sort of a match for Forbidden. Door, I completely maybe. forgot about that, to be honest. So. <laughs> I would love for it to be Shane Taylor. That could rule. Well, That'd be, be like a good minutes. Haas match. Yeah. <laughs> probably like eight it's minutes. Like... Shane Taylor's theme song. I, I this he might have the least over theme song in wrestling history. <laughs> and it's like there's some kind of – because I, I noticed this when I was watching Collision a couple weeks ago because uh, Lee Moore already came out to it, right? And there's something extra embarrassing about a incredibly unover theme song that starts with, like, a quote. So, like, you have the stinger, and he goes, rumble, young man, rumble. 
And like anytime these quotes are, you know, played for a theme song, it's supposed to get the entire crowd and they're being like, oh, here comes that guy. I know him. But like the entire crowd just like dead silence. Like had no idea what this is. So you hear the rumble, no, young man rumble, nothing. The music starts, nothing. Lemur already comes out, nothing. It's like three times, it's basically like getting three negative reactions, like completely nothing reactions at once. It's like kind of like tr- three times as bad. So uh, I would change his theme song, I guess is what I'm getting at here. Because the, uh, truly, the truly <laughs> troubling part of it is it's got a Muhammad Ali less over. <laughs> oh, boy. Um yeah, okay, so I do think that's finally everything on the card. Um, Wikipedia did betray me on the Jeff Cobb one. I just can't read on Tony Storm and Ishir Kawa. Uh, but uh, that's the show, so uh, I figured it'll be a good pay-per-view. Hopefully they deliver. Uh, it be very interesting to talk about next week. Adam, John, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for inviting us. You want to get any plugs yeah, in what? now? Uh, my very incredibly active podcast, Wrestling Omaka Say. <laughs> Uh, at Russell and Marcus say on Twitter. Um, I don't know. We'll probably do something for the G1, I guess. But look out for that. Coming soon. Definitely. Pull the dead spin, or I'm sorry, defector gimmick and get it done like two weeks into it. <laughs> uh, Adam, how about you? Any plugs you want to drop? No, I'm just, uh, I'll be writing some stuff for VOW coming up, doing some research right now for uh, something about uh, AEW that I'm working on and kind of the uh, booking patterns. Um, so the, I don't know exactly when, but I'll finish that at some point. And then I'll be writing some stuff around uh, uh, Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame season as well. So uh, definitely looking forward to that. Oh, thank you again for joining us. Tyler, that's us. Uh, you want to mention the Red Bubble thing? Or Red yeah. Table, whichever one. I, I can never Red, remember what it is. That's why you're the Red pro. Redcircle.com slash, I think it's, I, you know what? I should have this memorized. Um, the dash good dash the dash bad. It's the good, the bad, and the hungry AEW podcast with a bunch of dashes in there. Um, slash donations. If you yeah, guys right. want to con- contribute a little bit uh, for this wonderfully produced podcast that is always professional and has their stuff in order. Um, and like, comment, subscribe, uh, give us a five star uh, review on iTunes and Spotify. Um, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and those two places are going to get you everything that Voice of Wrestling does audio, and you will not regret it. In the meantime, thank you to our wonderful guests, Adam and John. I'm Tyler, he's Fred. Have yourself a great Forbidden Door weekend. Bye, y'all. Hey, kids, do you like wrestling? Well, we like wrestling, too. We are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Myself and Chris Novembrino kind of doing a lazy river of wrestling criticism, going through the news and whatever happened in stateside television wrestling. And also, you know what? Sometimes we just like to watch old stuff and talk about that, too. Love for you to give us a listen. If you haven't already, we are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network.